today's topic is going to be testing is not a nine to five job and this is going to be so much fun just to let you all know my name is Tristan I'm the community manager at testem and also the order uh, organizer of the modern test automation group meetup um, just again, as we mentioned before, we will be having more opportunities in the testing community for you all to connect with additional industry leaders. We've got Diego Molina coming, Andrew Krug. Um, we've had Pat, we have Erica Chestnut coming this Friday. So definitely sign up uh, for the testing community. It's free. Um, and you can learn more about it. I'll drop it in the link below. Um, that said as well, I just wanted to quickly thank Testum um, for supporting our group and being able to let us have these types of learning opportunities. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Testum, Testum is a leading AI-based end-to-end testing automation solution. So it gives our users the flexibility to use code or work with codeless tests. It's kind of whatever you want. We are committed to you all during this time and have created a free community plan for a thousand free runs a month. So check it out. We have a free certification program. You can up-level your skills. Um, but honestly, just come hang out with us in the community and have some fun. It's free. Um, with that said, that was a mouthful. <laughs> I want to get to the main event. <clears throat> I am so, 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 so happy that this day is finally here and that you all get to connect with Mike. Mike Lyles is not only an international keynote speaker, uh, not only the author of one of an amazing, amazing book that I enjoy dearly, The drive Through is Not Always Faster, and this is actually kind of part of how I connected with you, Mike, right? Um, yeah. And also, um, he's the director of uh, quality assurance and product management at Bridgetree. Um, he has, has over 25 years of experience in the industry and leading teams. And today he's going to talk to you a little bit more um, about not only his experience and not only about the topic today, but again, as this conversation evolves with new and rich content, Mike's going to continue to share um, an updated version. Um, this is my favorite talk. I feel like, like I'm just, <laughs> I'm so excited. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over the floor to you. All right. Thank you so much. Now. I'm the lighting is great, this. Mike. The lighting is great. <laughs> the lighting is, well, as I expected, I should have practiced this before. Oh, you're fine. You're in a brave space, Mike. Don't worry. It's going to make me quit and come back, Tristan. That's fine. That's what MacBook does. Hold on. Too funny. <laughs> we'll just edit this part out. <laughs> For those that don't know, Mike got a new computer. Bless him. Bless him. All right. Too funny. <laughs> That's what I was telling Mike earlier. I was like, you know, these days I'm just giving everyone the grace because um, we all deserve it, especially during these times. All right, Mike is back in action. <laughs> Such a such a horrible testing experience that I didn't test this at first. I just got a new MacBook. Mm -hmm. and you know, I'm not going to edit that out, Mike. Actually, I'm just going to leave that in the presentation because I think it's just beautiful. That's beautiful. <laughs> so I'm going to give the floor to you here, Mike. You go ahead and do your thing. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Yeah. So new MacBook, same. <laughs> stupid issues that <laughs> Mac Mac wants to to make sure that I'm I'm not uh, doing anything I shouldn't do so it now has given me permission to to zoom my presentations so Tristan it great great opening um, and, and great introduction I won't go through these but as you can look through this list I started out as a developer went through um, got into testing and really testing was the love of my life uh, for things that I really like to do. Um, I do I do have a lot of experience with a lot of large companies building out new processes and new organizations. Uh, the current company that I'm at did not have a QA team and, and when I started and now we have 10 people. And so we're continuing to grow there and doing a lot of things that I've learned along the way. 
uh, Tristan also mentioned it's great. Um, the the drive-through is not always faster. Is my book. Uh, you have to pay someone at Arby's twenty dollars to get them to let you take that picture right there. Um, but you'll be surprised how many people will not let you take pictures like Chick-fil-A, McDonald's, Hardee's. Those guys said no. But I finally found one um, and I paid them. But we're going to talk a little bit today about motivational. You know, Tristan mentioned my book is kind of a motivational self-help book. And as we think about testers, if you were a motivational tester, if we were going to do a talk on motivational testing, we'd probably turn this 360 degree leader talk into 360 degree testers. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which is a great, awesome book, would be The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Testers. Good to Great would be, of course, Good to Break. Instead, Start With Why would be Start With Why Not. Uh, the One Minute Manager would, of course, be The One Minute Tester. And then one of my favorite books, Never Wrestle With a Pig, well, I think we can keep that title the same. We have that problem every day at work, right? But I want you to think about this. When I'm in, when I'm at a conference and I'm presenting this, I get people to raise their hand and you can raise your hand at wherever you are now. But if you love your job, do you really love your job? Do you love what you're doing and, and how you're doing your job today? But the biggest question is raise your hand if you want to get better. And I think that's a big challenge for a lot of us is understanding what do I want to do and what things do I want to do to get better in my job? And I think just being here at this meetup, attending conferences and events, and, and, and attending uh, all the different things that you can go to, whether it's conferences in person or virtual events or these meetups, is a great way for you to learn more and to get better at what you're doing and get yourself lined up in the right way to do that. I will warn you, I have two children and three dogs, and they like to get loud every time I present. I can hear one of them doing it right now. So thank you so much to my son who I've warned that this is going to be taking place for this hour to let this dog do that. Ajay Balamurugadas said, if you have a plant in your house, your manager is not going to come water it. And I love that he did this at a conference and, and made this statement at a conference we were, we were in um, a couple of uh, weeks ago, I think. And I like that phrase because it really lines up with what I'm doing. And it really lines up with um, what I'm presenting today. And that is, yes, your job is going to give you some great opportunities. Yes, your job is going to help you be a great tester. And a lot of people will say to me that, um, that, they, uh, that they learn a lot from their job and they don't need to learn anymore. And that's just not true. Um, your manager is not going to come to your house and help you get better as a tester. Your HR is not going to help you grow in your career unless you reach out to them and you decide what you want to do with your skills and to get better. Now, the thing that got me started on this talk and thinking about this talk was watching Michael Phelps. A couple and if you don't know who Michael Phelps is, you've been hidden away somewhere for many years in history than anyone did in Olympic history. And we saw him, we saw him compete only a few months. But what we didn't see is him preparing in the gym, in the pool, what he did with his diet and, and what things he did to be a great swimmer. We only saw the outcome of all the work that he did. And we only saw um, how he competed once he had done all of these things. And, we have to be the same way. To be great in your job requires you to do those extra things beyond just the nine to five, just beyond doing your work every day. It's what do you do when people aren't looking or when you're not at work that make you really great at your work and, and what you do as a tester. Now, when, when Tristan posted this and he put it out there, someone responded and I love the response. And that was, you know, we have to get better. The world is changing. And it's and it, a lot of people don't keep up with how the world is changing. And I and it made me think about this um, quote from Stephen Covey. And I, I love watching him do it when he says this quote because he says nothing fails like success. And when he does that, he puts his fists together and he says, "What's working today to solve today's problems may not work tomorrow when tomorrow's problems or tomorrow's technology 
continues to evolve and, and grow and move upward. Now what was success before is no longer success today. So things that we did great years ago in testing may not be great now. Things that we're doing today that were really good in testing may not be great tomorrow. And so we have to, we have to continue to, uh, to grow and to, to learn that, um, that things that are successful today may not be as good tomorrow. So we have to keep learning. And when we think about how we learn um, testing and, and what we learn about testing, there are so many things that are fundamental. Covey talks about the core values and, and having core values. And those are things that are unchangeable core within you. And when I look at those, you have to really think about that when you're testing that while methods may change, processes may change, different things may change about how you do testing. There've got to be some fundamentals that you keep within you and you have to define those. What are my core values of testing? I think about a lot of the things that we hear commonly uh, among the testing community and it's still, uh, some of these you may still hear today. I love the phrase, I like breaking things. A lot of people say that. I used to say I wanted a shirt that says I like to break things, but then someone corrected me and said, you didn't break anything. You just found it broken because the developers, the team broke it. You just found it. You, we're investigative reporters and our job is to find it broken. There's nothing wrong with saying I like to break things, but just remember we don't break it. I love this phrase. Actually, I hate this phrase, but because it says, how do we miss this in testing? How many times have you heard that? How many times has your boss, your VP, your CEO asked that question? And the thing I always challenge them with is, I don't know, how do we miss it in requirements? How do we miss it in design? How do we miss it in development? How did we miss all the way back? Because quality and a quality product isn't just our responsibility. We are quality assistance, not quality assurance. And we're there to make sure that the product works and that the, and that the stakeholders get what they're expecting and that there's no problems there but we're not responsible for making sure it works every single time. We're responsible for making sure the whole team makes it work. So when I get that question, I usually give my sermon to everyone that asked that question. I get this a lot at many places that I've worked. I get it every day almost. And that is the testers asking too many questions. And it makes me proud of my testers when that happens because I want my testers to ask questions and I want our test team to ask a lot of questions because the more you ask, the more you're going to find out about the product. You know, you see investigative reporters news channel uh, on the news and people are given a news report. They've done their homework. They've took their pen and paper and they've written down what's going on. They've written down the names. They, you know, sometimes it's ad hoc and they have to quickly decide and we have to do that as testers. But a lot of times those news reports have come from long detailed investigations about what's going on. What is the situation? What are we going to talk about? And that's what testers need to be doing. Now, this is me when I was young. This is my brother on my dad's lap in the, in the 80s. Um, and I don't have those yellow pants anymore, but they were classy, right? Um, my dad worked in a factory and he worked in a factory for multiple decades. That, that, that was his occupation. And, and I like to use this analogy, not because I think factory working is not as, as good as us because if, you know, he, he, he supported our whole family with that, with that job. And he was great at that job as a factory worker. And this is not about factory workers, but my dad didn't come home every day and study about how he was going to be a better factory worker tomorrow. He didn't study the skills that he needed to do and what things he needed to do to grow to be better and better every day. Now he did take courses. He, he had multiple machinery and multiple things that he had to get trained on, but that was on the job. But he worked hard and he was very successful and got many rewards, uh, awards at his work because of it. We can do the same, but if you want to be great as a tester, it's more than what you do just at work every day. My very controversial slide, I love to share it every time, um, is the nine to five versus world-class testers. Your nine to five tester, they test at work or at the office only. Your world-class, they're testing everything they see. It's for that reason that people won't go test drive a car with me because I drive both anybody that's in that car and the dealership crazy testing everything in the car. 
everything, every functionality about the car, I test it. When I get a new TV, a new product, a new MacBook, which I didn't test before this presentation, things like that, you test it out and you make sure that things work and you try to break things. See there what I did? But the thing is about testing is you don't, you know, the nine to five doesn't study testing outside work, but your world-class te testers, they study testing, they attend webinars, they read blogs, they, they come to meetups like this, and nine to five is not involved in the testing community. I meet so many testers in the world that, that you randomly meet them or they interview for a job and they talk about, I don't, I don't socialize with a lot of people online. I don't talk with a lot of people. I don't go to events. Um, great testers like yourself, those of you that are here, you're here for a reason because you like interacting with the community, learning from other people. And, and you don't want to be nine to five where your learning is just limited in work. You want to learn from mentors and peers and other people. Now I have a quote that says, you may never know what you're capable of until you surround yourself with other great testers. Now I've had to change that phrase to other great people because in today's world with our agile processes and methodology, DevOps, fast sprints, speed to market, it's more about surrounding yourself with people that are great all the way across the team. You, you will learn, you need to learn what the developers are doing, what the product managers are doing, what the, what the stakeholders are doing. You need to learn what everybody's role is and, and, and understand the big thing to understand is their perception of quality. Because if you go to work tomorrow and, and you talk to your teammates tomorrow, Ask them what is quality to them, and you'll be surprised that their answer may not match what your answer is on the question, what is quality to you? And you have to understand what quality means to everybody to understand how to work effectively as a team. Now, one thing that when people see this presentation, but they don't attend it, they get very upset because they think I'm saying that you need to work more than nine to five. Now, I'm not asking you to do that. I'm not asking you to work 70 or 80 hours a week. It's really about how are you managing your time and what things are you doing both in and out of the office that help you to be a better tester. And it's, and it's focusing on those priorities and, and really having those priorities set on which things that are important to help you grow and not spending time on things or wasting time on things that are not helping you grow in your career. If we were together, I would poll around the room and I would ask you, did you start your career as a tester? And it's okay if you didn't, um, I didn't either. Um, my, my first interaction with computers was in sixth grade on an Apple IIe computer in the eighties, got my certification and said, I'm gonna be a programmer for the rest of my life. And I was a programmer, I was a developer, but I didn't do it for the rest of my life. Once I found testing, I, I found what I really enjoy doing. And what I find with people when I ask them, what did you do before? I've had people tell me all kinds of things, truck drivers, psychology majors, nurses, doctors, um, people come from different backgrounds. And I think that background helps you to be a better tester, things that you learn. I really like the one on psychology because I think understanding psychology and how the brain works and how people work and how, how people think really helps us work together with people in any job, but really, especially in the testing world. Now, again, a drive through is not always faster. It's not just the name of a great book. It's also a name of a process that I live by. And that is that how many times have you sat in a drive through window or a drive through line, line and waited and watched people go in, get their food and leave, and there you sit. And you're wondering, why did I not just go do the same thing? So I, I took this theory to that level and I very rarely sit in the drive through line because I know I can go in and get it faster almost every time. And I, and I shared that theory with someone who works in a drive through and they said, well, it may not be faster, but it is more convenient. Absolutely right. 100% correct. And I agree with that, but we don't get the, the uh, privilege of having the convenience tagged on to what we do as testers. Sometimes there's a better, faster, more efficient way to do things. And it might not be the same way you've always done it. So be able to think outside the box and look for other creative ways when you have roadblocks or obstacles. Now we'll say this, thanks to the virus, <laughs> 
the drive through is the only way right now uh, for most uh, restaurants and it's starting to open back up. But I do, I do think that the virus has also taught us another valuable lesson. And that is that we always have to be nimble and able to change whenever things change and the world's going to change. Viruses are going to hit. We're going to have to start working remotely. We're going to have to start working with teams over, uh, conference lines like this and we're not going to be able to do it in person and you have to get creative or new problems arise that you have to test that you didn't expect to be testing this month or next month. Now you might be saying, hey Mike, that's great, but I work for a company that says we've always done it this way and we're not going to change. Now what I suggest you to do is if you're working in a company, company that's doing it, of course do your job. You want to get a good rating and your boss to be happy but look for opportunities to, to slip some new ideas in and let it slowly get in. There's an eBay story about how eBay changed their color to yellow to white, from yellow to white and everybody lost their mind and they went back to yellow and then they slowly faded that yellow just a little bit every week and nobody noticed. Those gradual changes, you can slip those in and you can make a big change at the end. So look for opportunities to do that. But there is something worse than we've always done it this way. And that is everybody's doing it this way. Don't, you don't have to do it because everybody else is doing it this way. Some of our greatest innovative leaders, thought leaders, uh, inventors and, and successful people in this world were people who thought outside the box and said, I'm not going to do it the same way as everyone else. Now I'll tell you this, and it uh, does sound contradictory to what I just said, but that is a good way to learn how to deal with something is to listen to those that have already been through it themselves. Because sometimes it is good to learn from what people have experienced. And we see people that can help us learn from their uh, past work experience or their testing experience. So I did some surveys and I reached out to the testing community and I asked them, what are the testing activities that you do outside of work? I got a lot of, a, a lot of people, 87% of the people said that they read blogs, 55% use social media, 41% go to conferences, 41% take training courses, 43% go to meetups, 74% read articles and books on testing, 19% do crowd testing and 17% did selected other. Now, the one rule with creating a survey is if you give other, you better be prepared for people to select it because they will, because they're testers. And, but most of all, human nature, they're gonna pick others sometimes. So if they picked other, I forced them to tell me why and what they did that was not on that list. People said, I've learned development skills and automation skills, watch videos on, and podcasts. Um, I do mentoring or I get mentored face-to-face -face with other testers practice testing with self-made exercises, which I really like a lot of people that I come up with an idea, I'm going to test it. Uh, mobile games, um, spend a lot of time with your mobile phone. You could, you could test a lot of things there. Photography, anybody that's ever taken a photography course knows that that definitely is something you can test all kinds of variations of how to, how to use a camera job searching. Uh, I, I thought it was funny at first, but then I thought that's actually a pretty interesting way to understand what people need to help you decide what things you need to focus on to help yourself grow. So I think it was actually turned out to be a good idea. Uh, watching videos to find a testing relation. I love watching movies that take place, the time of the movie would be taking place years and years ago and try to catch something that was wrong. Maybe the car shouldn't be in that movie because it's current day, but it was an old day movie, if you know what I'm saying, or they're carrying an iPhone and iPhones wasn't invented during the time of that you know, the, the, the movie was taking place, uh, things like that. Someone said testing the quality of whiskeys. And I will tell you this, that if you do test whiskey a lot, uh, you will be a, become a very creative tester <laughs> doing your job. A lot of people talked about conferences and how conference numbers are growing. And I, and I think thanks to the, uh, to the virus, we've seen an increase in online events. A lot of people are really getting very used to doing online and virtual conferences. Uh, friends that I know and people that I know that have done virtual conferences always uh, are seeing a lot more people showing up to their events now because we can't travel. We can't go to places and, and conferences aren't taking place in person. 
So you're here at this meetup, keep going to these things, keep signing up for things, keep looking for opportunities. Blogs and articles, very big thing. Um, if you were writing a blog and you quit, restart it, start it back up. People are listening to what you're talking about. And if you don't have one, I can help you get one started. I can help you think about some ideas. Um, I asked people, how do they learn different testing ideas at work? I mean, learn about testing at work. Some said learning different domains, latest technologies and strategies, learning development practices, not a requirement, but it's good to understand what developers do if you're supporting them. Uh, customer views. And I think understanding the customer view and the client or the stakeholders, understanding that business person, Michael Bolton talks about that a lot. Um, and I think it's very important that we understand exactly what the, the, what the stakeholders think about the product, how they're going to use the product and, and what the product means to them. Because if they do that and you can think like the stakeholder, then you're going to be a better tester. Exploratory testing, pair testing is huge more today than ever. Um, when we get back to the office and we have more people working back in the office, I think in-house brown bag lunches are great um, because a lot of people may say, well, I don't have time to, to meet after work. I don't have time to do things on the weekend. I have kids, I have responsibilities, but you can do it at work during lunch. Everybody bring lunch, meet together. Um, studying security testing, trust me, with all the things, just as Tristan and Minnett had, had, had talked about at the start, lots of security uh, growth of security potential now with everybody doing things online right now and companies working online. Uh, beefing up your security uh, testing experience would be great. It's the time to do it. Learning from junior level testers, entry level, or training them as well. And then making testing fun, which I, I wanted to make sure was not making fun of testing. Uh, but the one, the one big thing, I'm, I'm going to go through these pretty quick because it just lets you see a couple of these. But the ones that I liked here on this list really were around um, mentorship programs, number five. Um, meeting with the customers, again, was a big thing. Um, number eight, changing the mindset of non-testing teams about testing importance. We've probably all been in that situation. I know I have in multiple um, organizations where you have to really start pleading the, the importance of testing and why testing is important. It's a tough place to be in. But when you do that, don't talk about, well, I wrote test cases or I wrote test scenarios and I executed them and we're here for a purpose. Talk about the value of what got resolved because you found something and what that bug would have caused in production had you not found it. Those are the way you, you show the value of testing. And the last one there, removing quotas from testing. That's a big thing. Um, stop counting bugs, stop counting test cases, stop counting pass and fail. Don't worry about those metrics. Worry about your um, confidence in the product. My test team, we have a report that we send out. We don't talk about the number of bugs that we found or the number of test cases that we've executed. We talk about what is my confidence, high, medium, low in the product. Do I have high confidence right now? Do I feel good enough about this feature in this product that, that, that I feel that we should move forward? And our teams have adapted to that and that's how we communicate how well the product is, is going to be. And the one big one was minimize meetings. A lot of people talking about how the meetings really suck up a lot of your time. And if you're, those meetings aren't with the stakeholders or with the team talking about how you're gonna produce that product, then those meetings really are taking a lot of your time from your day. Michael Bolton, great phrase. It's long, I'm gonna read through it real quick. But as testers, one of our most important jobs is to reveal problems that threaten the value of the product and the on-time successful completion of the project at every level of granularity. We are investigative reporters. And we get swept up in so many times about how many defects did we find, how much have we tested. But as a tester, our job is to ask questions. And the more you ask, the more you're gonna get back and the more you're gonna learn. Um, when I first started this current job, almost four years ago, I was working with a team and we met with a client and, and I started asking, I looked at the requirements document, which was already done. And I started asking, why is this requirement there? What are you gonna do with this? How are you gonna use this? And they started saying to me, I have no idea. 
I don't remember asking for that. And we spent some time going through that mind mapping and, and really resetting the requirements for that project. And we, we, we cut a lot of stuff out. We added some new things, but we came out with a product that they really wanted. And, and by just asking simple questions, had I not asked that question, we would have delivered just what they had agreed to months before. Now, many people have asked me about certifications and I will respond with this. I got a certification back in 2012 CTFL. ISTQB. But I'll also tell you this, my son is 17. Um, he's really good with dogs, as you heard. Um, and he just got his driver's license about two years ago. And what I realized when he took my car, this picture here, uh, right after this picture, and started to pull out without looking every which way, was that he can read every book, you can study, you know, and, and, and you can study and learn how to be a great driver. But when you get on that road, that's when change, things change. And understanding how to, to drive and the fundamentals of reading signs and when to change lanes and when to turn left or right and when to crank the car, when to use the lights and all these things, those are things that you need to know. They're, they're fundamentally good. And so again, don't get me wrong, I got a certification many years ago and I think it does help us to understand some of the fundamentals. But Having a license like any other training or certification doesn't make you a better driver. You simply can understand those fundamentals. And so when that car comes around the curve and it doesn't have headlights on or one pulls out in front of you or changes lane in front of you, you have to understand the context of that situation and how you deal with it. So you'll become a great tester for looking for those opportunities in life um, where you were never trained for. Things that you know can take you to a new level in, in what you do as a tester and learning and using those things as you go, building upon those. Another thing I like to do when we're all together is tell people in the room, look under your seat and the person with this number is gonna be the winner and everybody looks. And what I love about that is the fact that I have that much influence on the stage as a presenter that people believe that I really did put numbers under the seats and I stop them and I tell them, Please stop it. There's nothing under your seat. But why do they do that? You know, I, I didn't say that I'm an expert on lotteries and, and winning the lottery and putting numbers under the seat, but they know that I'm standing up there. I'm somebody that the, that the conference has respected to come and speak and they take me seriously and they take my job seriously. You have to gain that respect with your teams and the more respect you, that you gain from them, the more that you're going to get them to believe each and everything that you say. So when you say, I don't have confidence, I don't think this product is going to work. They're going to say, let's stop production, figure out what's going on because the tester said they don't have confidence and you need to build that confidence and continue to build it out. Now Zig Ziglar said, we all have 24 hour days. Nobody gets more or less than any of us. We all get the same. But now after you take out sleep, which is, eight hours and at best <laughs> for most of us, probably less. And you take out work, which is nine hours usually, all you got is your time, which is about seven hours. And that's not counting what you have to take your kids to, what you have to do at home, what you have to do around your house, your landscaping, your housework, your, your kids, where you take your family, all these different things. So you have to, you have to really be judicial with your time and think about when am I gonna spend my time focusing on some things that might help my career. And so you have to be looking for those things. And watch out for distractions. I have huge distractions and mine is TV. Any of these a problem to you? <laughs> these ruined me many times in my job, um, especially Game of Thrones. I didn't watch it till late and then I watched all seven or eight seasons at once. And it just, that's all I did for like a week. So you have to make sure that you have fun and you enjoy life and you get to do things you like to do, but also don't, don't let these things completely consume every bit of time that you, that you have free. Because if you want to be a great tester, continue to grow and learn. And I always have an opinion, you know, testers seem to accept things because they don't feel they have the authority. And they feel like that, well, I can't ask that because I'm a, just a tester. I'm not the product manager. I'm not the developer. I'm not the stakeholder. But yeah, ask the questions. Sometimes you can get some really good engaging questions, I mean, uh, responses by doing it. And remember that you don't have to have a management title 
to have that opinion. Take a stand, but don't make it personal and don't be offensive. You know, a lot of times people do that. They'll have an opinion. You know, we, we see that all over the world right now, right? Um, I got an opinion. If you don't agree like me, then you're stupid. I'm smart. Don't let that happen. Have your opinion. Listen to other people's opinion, but work it out with people. Socialize. One big thing is there's tons of groups on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all webinars, meetups like this, a lot of ways to interact. If you're not on Twitter, I suggest you get on Twitter. It's a fun thing to do. Um, a lot of people interacting. And if you get on Twitter, please follow me. I would love that. And I'll follow you back. And I'll also add you to a, a testers list that I have where you'll see almost 2000 people that you can follow that will likely follow you back as well. And you can interact and see the, the, the tweets that those folks are putting out there. Study the writings of great testing uh, leaders and people that are out there in the community. There's so many good books. I could talk for an hour on just the ones I have. If you'll reach out to me, uh, I'll be glad to share with you several of the books that are, um, that I've been reading lately and a couple of that are, that are very recent um, that would really help you as a tester as well. And, you know, just reach out and I can share it with you. Um, sites to follow a lot of great blog sites, a lot of great places that you can look and learn from. Um, Testopedia is a sub directory within my blog page. So if you go to Mike Lyles, dot wordpress.com and go to my testopedia link there's tons of links there i need to update it so if you're someone that's watched a previous presentation of this and i said i'm going to add yours i am getting to that i'll try to get that this week get the new ones added because a lot of people have reached out to me if you've got a blog site where you write about testing and you don't see it there reach out to me as well i can get it added testing all the time you know i've got to hurry i'm running up close on our time here but um Think about how you test all the time. I love this when I was four, my sister was two, right? Now think about this. Now I'm 44, how old is my sister? This came from Ben Simo. If you know Ben Simo, he's amazingly funny, awesome. I can tell you stories about him for two or three hours, but we won't. Just look him up, you'll be happy. Quality Frog is his Twitter handle. But he posted this and he said, when I was four, my sister was two, I'm now 44, how old is my sister? And and he posted this response that was on LinkedIn where a guy said, well, this is a tough one. She might be 42, but she could be 41 or 43. Also, since you didn't say when your birthday is and her birthday is, she could be dead. Finally, you might have thought she was your sister, but actually your mom had an affair with another man. And now the woman who is one to three years younger than you is not actually your sister, but your mom may have given your real sister for adoption, in which case she's probably older than you. See why that's tough. Finally, what if you think your sister's dead, but she actually has become an astronaut on a secret government project for near light speed travel? Then your sister would be aging more slowly than you, so she could be potentially even be younger than 41. Now, you're laughing because you're a tester. People that are not testers do not think that's funny at all. They're like, this is stupid. But I had a few other ones and I wanted to share. What if the numbers aren't ages? Perhaps they're positions in a queue. What if they're apartment numbers? What if they're bowling scores? What if their number of Twitter followers? Um, someone said, what if we're talking, are we talking about years or months or minutes? Um, someone, yeah, same with the years here. You know, forget about the user being dead. Sister could now be older than the user or forgot about it. The tester missed the option. You might have two sisters. You know, this is what testers do. This is why I say get on Twitter. Uh, and then someone says, isn't the answer to everything always 42? You know, of course, Ben said when, except when it isn't. Now, one more set. Here's what developers say, right? Let's deploy with 42. We'll think about that in the next iteration. Uh, Friday is the best day to deploy. No one else is deploying. So your deployments go 100% faster. And if it fails, you know that it was your deployment that caused it. Um, none of these possibilities were mentioned in the statement of work. So this is all scope creep. I love this one. A project manager would then ask the client, how old they wanted the sister to be so that the correct acceptance test would be created. And there's an agile PM with all of these use cases in the backlog with the priority nice to have. And my favorite, this is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> so uh, lots of commentary on that. If you go out there and you find Ben Simo, you can see even more. I, I spent 
way too much time reading these and laughing. But I would ask each of you, how would you test a TV controller? If we were together, I would say, let's test a controller. And I would hand you a controller and I would want to hear what things did you think about? What things are going through your mind right now when you think about how you would test a controller? You know, did you consider everything? Is it connected to a TV? Are there batteries in that controller? Is it plugged into power? Is this controller for this specific TV? You know, those kind of things you have to think about. And a lot of people, I'll interview people and I'll ask them that question. How would you test a controller? Many people will forget batteries, you know, and many people will forget that the TV needs power or the house needs power to be able to do it. So think about those things. Um, I saw this sign in an elevator at a conference I was at once and I did not test that one. So you don't have to test everything, uh, trust me. Sometimes you just have to trust that that's what's gonna happen if you do jump up and down in an elevator. And my last quick story for you is the Rubik's Cube. For 30 years, I have been carrying Rubik's Cubes all around, you know, not carrying it with me like every day, but I have had Rubik's Cubes somewhere in my house, wherever I've lived. And I loved Rubik's Cubes. My first keynote was about what the 80s taught me about software testing, and I had a Rubik's Cube for that. But anybody that's played around with Rubik's Cubes knows that there's three ways to solve a Rubik's Cube. <clears throat> the first one is to take it apart, which is exactly how I did it in the 80s. Take it apart, put it right back together, solves the problem, right? All it takes is a few minutes. And the other is taking stickers off, which I never did, but my friends did. And then, then their Ruby's cubes looked really horrible because the stickers don't go back very well, right? And then there's the third one, which is the correct one, by the way, and that is learning the algorithm. And that's something I learned after 30 some years, I learned it just two weeks ago. Don't have time to show you how I do that, but I do have one with me. Um, but when you learn the algorithm, when you go out and look at YouTube, there are many solutions for it and they all end up with a solved Rubik's cube. But what, what I found was that when you learn that algorithm, it helps you to always solve the Rubik's cube. And there are many algorithms to do it. Same with testing. We can try out many algorithms, heuristics, oracles, methods, see which work. Sometimes blend them, sometimes change them. Solving a Rubik's cube, you might solve it one way today and you can repeat it repetitively solve it that way every time. And you may go to a different algorithm tomorrow that may be faster and it's different, but you're still solving it. So learn as a tester that there are different ways, different methodologies, different approaches that you can use. We already touched on sharing your story, but do. If you're, if you're thinking to yourself, I don't have anything to say, then start a blog and talk about what things you did at work this week, what problems you have, what constraints that you had, because there's somebody out there who's gonna read it, who's gonna interact with you, and you're gonna start building that interaction with the community. I ask a lot of people, do you have a mentor? And I asked 267 people in a survey once, did they have a mentor? 243 said they did not. I strongly suggest that you get a mentor. Doesn't have to be a paid one, doesn't have to be an official mentor, but reach out to somebody. I've been a mentor to a lot of people. And as I do this talk, I get a lot of people that reach out to me and ask, can you help me and give me some mentorship? Um, and, I've, and I've created some documents that I send to people that helps them learn more about um, testing and some of the ideas that I've put together and I share them that. And then if they want to take it further and, and continue mentoring with me, then we continue to do that. But understand that you don't have to just have one. I have multiple people that I call mentors in my life. Somebody that helps me with this aspect of my life or that aspect. So it doesn't have to be one, but reach out to some people that you have respect for and learn from them. Now, one of the things I've noticed recently and in in very recently is there was a forum that I've been, been part of and all the people in that forum are masters of that forum, it's a leadership forum. And what I find is everybody in that, in that forum, in that group are discussing leadership, but they're all leaders. They're all accomplished people who have already learned leadership. And, and what I learned is that you need to interact with people that are both masters, you know, that's good. And we've talked about that, but also interact with people that are not masters. Because if you wanna see growth in your career, help somebody who wants to grow in theirs and help 
you know, what I've learned is I learned so much more helping people than I think they learn from my helping them. I learn by helping others and I learn by uh, figuring out how to explain to them how certain things happen. It's like having a child and they ask, why is the sky blue? Why is the grass green? When you have to explain exactly why that is, um, it helps you learn and then they learn as well. So I learned from coaching and mentoring. You can learn the same. Speaking of learning, Mike, so sorry to interrupt. We yes. do have a few questions, and I know we're both from the South, and we could do this all day. But I just want to make sure we get to a few questions, but I want yes. to make sure you I'm sorry. All right. Absolutely. Well, this, this was nearing my last slides anyway. So I love this slide because you're going to take these great ideas back. You're going to go to your company, and somebody's going to say, that's great. Get back to work. Don't let their negativity. It's a little harsh to say hate. But don't let people's negativity keep you from continuing to grow here. Don't let people say to you, oh, it's great you've gone to a webinar, or you didn't learn anything, or you did learn something. Continue to grow. Think about what you want to achieve in the next 10 years, 10 days, 10 months. And remember that people know you for what you've done, not for what you plan to do. I talked about writing a book for 17 years. I finally did it. Take your ideas a little bit every day and put them into action. Last slide. You have the potential to change the world. You don't have to be Elon Musk, Sheryl Sandberg, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg. You can change the world right where you are today. So what are you doing to be great? And that's it. Woo! You. You <laughs> friend. Awesome. This is really, really, really great. I appreciate you. Back in the day, I would have been like, hello, Mike, and I want to come on stage. But here we are virtually. I'm just... <laughs> Really appreciate you sharing with us, and I know our audience does too, and some of them had a few great questions, actually. Okay. Um, you ready to just dive into a few of those? Absolutely. All right. So the first one I love, and this is from Marie, and regarding you were talking about now is a great time to, you know, improve on security training, I'm sorry, training and security testing. What are some resources that you'd recommend? So there, there are a lot of courses online. Uh, a lot of a lot of um, sites that I can share with you, Marie. I'll send you an email. Um, but there's there's for for automation, for performance, for security. I think um, I'm trying to think of the Burp Suite. If 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 it's B U R P uh, S U I T E, just as it sounds, Burp Suite. A lot of people use that. Burp Suite has a lot of um, uh, blogs and articles on uh, security testing, and then that kind of branches out from there. Burp Suite is good. Um, conferences are starting to, I, the conferences that I work with, a lot of um, a lot of times I will suggest we need to add more security talks. And, and there's some uh, several conferences that I could suggest to you um, that you should attend that, that really touch on people that have experience in security testing. And also, um, if you connect with me on Twitter, and I think you already are, I'll send you a note um, to anyone that asks. But uh, there are some great people out there who really understand security testing at a very high level, at an ethical hacking, and a, you know, understanding how we would get hacked or penetration testing, vulnerability testing, um, and, and I can, can connect you with those folks. I wouldn't say I'm an expert in that, um, but we are building that out in my company as well. I think it's super, super helpful. And we'll also be sure to put these um, responses um, in the activities as well in the group. Um, I do want to make sure we get through the next question. Um, and Marie will make sure we get you those resources. Um, I have another great question from um, another member in the community. Um, Jason wants to know real fast, do you have any recommendations on the ratio between developers and testers? <laughs> I love that question. Um, I think it should be nine testers to every one developer. I think that's a better ratio than, <laughs> no, I'm just joking, I'm joking. So, um, wow, I, I think that's a hard number. You know, if you'd asked me that back in 2012, when I'd been in testing for about three years, four years, I would have probably said uh, three to one, you know. You need, you need uh, one tester for every three developers. And a lot of our uh, estimations that we did for, um, development and testing when you would come up with numbers. If I didn't have all the details to do a good test test estimate, I would take a third of the development hours and say that's how long it's going to take us to test. 
what I find is that that's not really the case. I mean, it really depends in the end. And it's a horrible answer. Depends is always a horrible answer, but you really need to look at, um, when you think about the ratio is what is the complexity of that uh, product uh, at minimum, I would think, you know, and I always use that as a minimum at a minimum, I would want to have one tester to every three developers, but, um, but that changes. Sometimes I have one to one in some of the projects that we do, especially if it's a very complex project um, or, you know, uh, two to one. So uh, it's a tough question to answer, but I would say, you know, on our team, right now we have with every project we have we have one tester on each of the projects and there's probably two to three developers each one so um, i see that works but a lot of times with some of our really major deliverables we have to add a second tester in there so sometimes you're looking at a maybe you know three developers two testers kind of thing so hope that helps that was super awesome. Thank you for that, Mike. Um, and we'll obviously continue this conversation on Twitter because we're already tweeting. Here we are. Um, I put your link there too. Um, this is a great question. Um, this one's coming from Priyanka. So Priyanka wanted to know if you could talk a little bit more about um, what are some leading or lagging indicators that are meaningful to measure in terms of the context of quality, um, just to understand more about what is hurting the team or business. Yes. So I do, I do a, I do a talk called metrics, um, tell a story, not a number. And we, we joke around during the first half of that presentation, but it, it goes to the fact that numbers don't tell you much of anything unless you have context around those numbers. Um, a lot of people look at, I ask, I ask a lot of people when I interview them, if I give you a project and it already has 500 defects, what can you tell me about that project? And a lot of people will say, well, that project's in trouble. But what if that project is a three-year project and you've only found 500 defects through the whole three years? That might be a good project. What if it's a very small project and every one of those 500 defects are critical? And it's really important to, to understand the context of what those metrics are telling you. So one of the things that I do is a testing dashboard. Um, and I give credit to James Bach for creating that. If you don't know who James Bach is, please reach out to me. I can introduce you to a whole brand new process, context-driven testing and, and, and a dashboard on metrics that really, I think, help you to tell how things are. Um, like I mentioned earlier during the presentation, we don't talk about percent pass-fail. Uh, we do talk about defects because the quality of the defects will tell you, you know, if I've got 10 critical defects, then this project is, it needs to be looked at, right? But if I've only got 10 cosmetic defects, low, low priority defects, that might be okay. But what you really need to look at is your confidence. Do I feel like that I've thoroughly tested this enough? And the tester needs to be able to come back and say, for each of these features, here's how much I plan to test it. And it's really, when I say plan, it's not how many test cases or how many steps I'm going to run. It's how, how, how much intensity am I going to do? High, medium, and low? And how much have I done already? If I'm going to do high intensity testing on this and I've only done low uh, so far, my confidence may be low. So I would think, and, I, and I'll be happy to share with you an email, some, some of the dashboards that we've used, um, but it's really, it talks more about telling a story. So when the stakeholders or the users come to you and say, how are things? Then you start talking about what you've seen and what you're experiencing more than well, we're 80% done. And the last thing I'll say there is, because if you count test cases, I've got 10 test cases and I've ran nine, so I'm 90% done. That doesn't tell me anything but, but progress. It doesn't tell me about quality because that last one that I need to run may be the biggest test of all 10. And it may be the one that's gonna have the most critical time needed with it. So 90% done only tells me progress. It doesn't tell me quality or 90% or pass fail. You know, what if 90% passed, but those 10% that failed were all critical showstopper defects. So look more about confidence and hopefully that helps. And that was super, super awesome, Mike. I appreciate that. Um, I know we're at the hour. I am wondering if you have time for one last question from a fan of Sure, yours. absolutely. And go as long as you want. You're wonderful. I have a question. This is from Marlon. And Marlon wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about 
um, sharing some pathways to better analyze a legacy system um, when your team's goal is to analyze refactor and get a better product by refactoring. Wow. <laughs> I know I so, threw that one in there for you, you know, casual. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no big deal. So I, I, I worked for a major uh, home improvement warehouse. There's only two, so this one was blue. Um, and I will tell you this, that I worked there for 20 years. And so we did a lot of refactoring of old systems. And a lot of times we continue to keep those old systems in place for store systems. And I think the thing that you have to do, uh, and I'm doing this on the fly, but I'm, I think the real thing that you have to understand is I use mind maps a lot when we, when we work with the teams. And I think if you haven't used mind mapping, again, reach out to me on that. We can talk about it. But mind mapping is a great way to brainstorm and come up with ideas for what things are working, what things are not. Um, I think when you do that practice and you build a mind map and you start categorizing um, areas within that application, the legacy app that or legacy product um, that that are good, you know, maybe to me, I categorize them into these are things that are not working. We know they're not working and they never have. We need to fix that. And it may not be broken things. It may be process things that need to change. Um, and, and things that are working really well, but need to be refined. You know, it's like cell phone was great in the 90s and the 2000s, but now we have smartphones. So, you know, is this, you know, great areas. And that helps you define and expand that later. But just start with brainstorming and get everything in a mind map about everything you can about the product. And I hope I'm going in the right direction here for you because I think what you're wanting to do is how do I understand what areas do I need to focus on? What areas do I need to just chop out and, and come up with a new product? And then what areas am I gonna have day-to-day -day constant maintenance and keep that product going? And in that case, for the day-to-day -day stuff, you just really need to understand, am I continuing to, to uh, to build on that application so that it stays up to date. You know, I look at old laptops that I used years ago that are nowhere near as fast as the one I'm using today. Um, they did the purpose, they did what I wanted them to do, but they're not fast. And we need speed in a lot of our products today. So I think that's one thing you have to look at is performance. And sometimes to upgrade that performance, you have to overhaul the system completely. But I think you you brainstorm the ideas and and you think about, what's working, what's not working and needs to be removed, what's not working and needs to be resolved, and then what's working well, but we continue to improve. I hope, I hope that helps. Um, legacy, man, we could talk about that for, for a long time. And I, I could give you a lot of my experiences on what I've learned with legacy testing. But the other big thing I'll say there is regression testing. Um, remember that you don't have to test everything. Um, that you don't have to completely have high coverage, but you need to understand what areas of that regression test you do need to test every time, because there are certain areas that you need to highlight that are high risk, that if they, if they stopped working because you've made a change, then that could be a big deal to your company and to your customers. This is super, super awesome, Mike, and I really appreciate that. I know Priyanka and Marie and Mike and Marlon do too. There was, and I know you said you went up for one more. Sure, sure. <laughs> I think this is a really important question, and this is coming from Paul. And what's a little bit more? Um, can you tell just a little bit more about kind of how you measure um, growth, professional growth in your career? If we're thinking about metrics for growth and success, um, like what are some of your metrics? Oh, I love that. You know, Paul, thank you, Paul, for asking that because it was Paul, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the things I show in a leadership presentation that I do, that I'm actually doing next week at another event, is I talk about stock value and how that the stock market, a lot of times in the stock market, you'll start, and I'm going to go this way because I think that's the way I'm going. Am I going left or right if I do this? Um, yeah, then I, I think this way is left to right because of the things inverting me. But anyway, you start on a, in a stock market, you know, the stock price will go up and then something big will happen. And, and you're thinking stock's going to go even higher, but it doesn't. It drops a little bit because the market says, well, this company's had this major change and we want to drop it a little bit because we know there's risk there. And then it will come back up when we feel confident that they're, they're growing. And so I thought of this in my career as a stock 
graph of a, of, of a stock symbol in that, you know, when I started, I went to school, right? And I graduated school and I was like, my value dropped a little bit because I've got training, but I don't have experience. They'll tell you that if you've ever had that experience, I had it multiple times back in 93 when I tried to get a job and they're like, well, you don't have experience, so we can't hire you. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, but I don't have a job, so I can't get experience. Cycle, right? But then when I got the job, then I started growing in my career and then I got promoted to the next level. Well, I'm new to that level, so my experience is dropping a little. So to answer your question more directly, all through the year I've had, all through my life, the stock keeps going up, but it drops a little every time because I get in, put into a new role and it drops. And the one thing that I found was that for many years, I sat in the same job over and over and over. And as I look back on it and I say to myself, what would I do differently over these 27 years now um, is I would have made some some revisions and looked at some of the things that I've looked at in the last 12 years of my career, I would have done that a little bit earlier. I may not have stuck with the same company for 20 years. I may have moved around and got some experience working with other companies and other areas uh, and other business areas. But I, but I also would have started speaking more, interacting more in conferences, interacting with people more and learning more from other people. I didn't even know until 2011 and 12 that you could be a speaker, you know, and, and do this at conference. I just thought those were always already selected, you know, pre-selected for the events. And I would never do that. Once I started it, this is my 56th event that I've spoken for since 2012. So, you know, you can, I'm very addicted to doing that and talking to people and interacting with people. But I think the thing that really helped me in my career, uh, the, the thing that changed uh, to me, the, the shift was not when I was a developer, not when I was um, a lead developer, but when I became a manager. And it's in my book as well. There were two major parts of my life where I felt like life had to change, right? Yes. And, and where things changed for me was when I realized it's not about me, it's not just about me, it's about the people that I work with. And it's not only about, I was looking out for my career for a long, long time, but in 2000, I'm now responsible for three people. Then I'm responsible for 15 people. And then through the years, I was responsible for 100 people. And so my, their career is responsible to me. You know, I'm responsible for what they're learning and they're doing. And so what I found with my career and what really helped me was, like I said earlier, when I started helping and coaching people to build their career, it helped me to understand where I wanted to go with mine. And the big thing that I help anybody with, and you should do this as well, figure out where you want to be figure out what the roles and responsibilities of that goal are, you know, like if I used to tell programmers or testers, you want to be at that next level, make a list of all those roles and responsibilities and start checking them off whether or not you're doing them already. Because when you get promoted, it should be because you're already doing that role. And, and if you want to grow, then that needs to be the things you look at to grow. But the last thing I'll tell you, and this is going to contradict just a little bit. I learned that my happiness in my job was not about how much money I make. It, was not, it does not matter what my title is. It's what I'm doing and what I'm achieving in my job and the people that I interact with and the influence that I'm going to leave with my book, with my talks, with my coaching and mentoring. That's what I want to leave. And that's a legacy that you should want to leave as well. As well. It is really around you know, think about more than just what, did I, what do I do to grow in my job? Think about what are you going to leave to the world when you leave here, you know, and what kind of things do you want to accomplish your bucket list of things? And it took me 25 years almost to figure out that that was more important to me than how much I make per hour, how much I make per year and what my title is in the role. So I would, I would focus on that and, my book does help with that. I'm not trying to sell it, but I will tell you the book does help you think about those ideas. I am trying to sell it, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate you and your honesty. Um, no, I really did. This is how Mike and I, um, this and I think we met at South Sabs too, but I just like, I just, I really just, I just loved your book and I loved it at the conferences. So, you know, honestly, it's, it's a really short read for all of you people with um, not strong reading skills. Um, full disclosure, I still haven't finished Lisa Crispin's book. I love it really. 
Love Her Dearly, also available on Amazon. <laughs> and a great book. Okay. Great oh, book. Yeah. And there's a great part in there about testing with legacy systems too, absolutely. So with that said, Mike, I want to thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, and this recording will be available and we'll share that on YouTube. We'll post it in this meetup group. And Mike, um, I'm wondering if you're open. I know we talked a little bit about some resources. I could share some notes with you, but I'm wondering if you'd be okay just dropping this in our community on Slack just real fast, like boom, 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 so some other people can see it. Okay. All right. Yeah, you. it's very low lift. I know, I know you've got a lot on your plate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I'll be happy to do that. Oh, you're amazing. And you know, um, right now you're getting a standing ovation. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much. And thank you to the people that were able to stick around a little bit after the hour. Um, again, Mike, we really, really are grateful for you sharing. Um, if you're not already following Mike on Twitter, or on social, LinkedIn, all the information is in the presentation below. Um, and with that said, thank you for learning with us today and stick around for more events within the Modern Test Automation Meetup Group and also in our community on Slack. Awesome, thanks Mike, take care, thank you all. Thanks folks. Bye.